the mid-70s, former General Motors engineer John Zachary DeLorean had a dream. A dream to build a car his way. An ethical car, and very different to what was being turned out by Detroit's automakers at the time. DeLorean was a corporate superstar, and using his own considerable charisma and salesmanship, he convinced getting on for 200 hard-nosed US dealers to not only sign up, but also each invest thousands of dollars in his company. With this seed money and cash from other high-profile investors, he started readying his car for production. Fast forward three years, and there's UK government money in the project, a brand new factory nearing completion, and a hyped up US public forming orderly lines to put down deposits at dealerships. The dream was about to become reality, but as it turned out, had a nightmare ending. So why the scrapyard setting for today's show? Meet two die-hard DeLorean enthusiasts who, 30 plus years on, will explain why. Part of DeLorean's idea was a, was a sports car, well sports GT, um, that, that would last. You know, it was a, a car that would maybe even outlast the owner, it would be around for years to come. Um, you know, the, for example, the, the cars surrounding me now, these are not very old cars, whereas, the, you know, they been scrapped for various reasons, but the DeLorean, the idea of that was that it wouldn't rust away like a lot of cars, um, you know, around when this was developed, you know, rust was a huge problem. Uh, the, the bodywork of the car is uh, unpainted stainless steel, uh, which was a, sort of a, an original idea at the time for mass production, which was that cars could be made to last with a guarantee of 25 years without any rust because it was a common problem like for earlier cars to uh, basically rust away. Um, they didn't have the rust protection methods that they do these days and building a car out of stainless steel was, was the idea that it would last. You know, stainless steel body on top of a fiberglass shell. Um, they also went as far as to offer a 25 year guarantee against corrosion. Um, the stainless steel was, was Sheffield stainless steel and the, the manufacturers and DeLorean were, were going to offer this guarantee. So his idea, John DeLorean's idea, was that the car, it would last forever, it would, it would outlast the owner. The car's quite a unique design um, in the image of Lotus. It was developed by Lotus, um, so it's quite similar to the construction of the um, early 80s Lotus Esprit, whereby you have a, a backbone chassis, um, double Y backbone chassis, the engine's in the back, fuel tank's in the front, luggage compartments in the front. On top of that chassis you've got a fiberglass shell, fiberglass tub as they call it. On top of that you've got the stainless steel panels, these are non-structural panels, they're just bolt on. Um, the structure of the car is in the chassis and the tub, um, except for the doors which are stainless steel inside and out, full, full construction. Um, the, yeah, like I say, it's rear-engined, um, it's not mid-engined, the engine is actually over the back wheels. Um, because of that, it's got quite a high weight bias to the back. That's why you've got the bigger wheels at the back, larger tires to try and even that out. There were, uh, there were around 8,500 cars built uh, at the time, and majority of which ended up in the US because that was their intended market. Uh, it's thought that there's around 6,500 still on the road worldwide, which is quite a good survival rate. Um, about 120 uh, to 30 of which are in the UK. The engine is a, is a Renault um, engine. Well, it's actually a PRV, which is a Peugeot Renault Volvo V6 engine. Um, a combined effort between the manufacturers to come up with a V6 engine. Um, this engine was used in many different cars uh, right from the 70s up to the 90s. The specific variant of it used in the DeLorean is um, it's a fuel injected, Bosch mechanical fuel injected, 2.8 litre V6. Um, it's similar to what was used in the non-turbo Renault Alpine. Um, it was more or less an off-the-shelf engine. Um, had DeLorean, you know, tried to build their own engine or have Lotus build an engine for the car, the, the cost of the car, which was already above what they um, initially wanted it to be, would have, would have gone through the roof. So they, they opted for a more or less readily available engine. Uh, the transmission is a Renault UN1, uh, which again is a very common transmission. So. Um, 
repairing the engine, doing any jobs to the engine, getting parts, it's, it's all easily obtainable. and It's not difficult to work on the engine at all. So a lot of things are just off the shelf. If you, you know, there are car clubs which can identify which parts can be cross-matched and uh, they're, generally speaking, everything is easily available. Having one of these cars for me has not been an issue mechanically because of the support from clubs and, and fellow owners. Um, there is a huge fan base uh, and you know enthusiast group that, that keep these cars on the road. Like a lot of the uh, the guys that have these cars now, they're starting to get these cars now, it starts from seeing the Back to the Future films and seeing it as a sort of screen star um, that I didn't realise at the time that it was an actual car, I just saw it as a, a prop from the film. Um, and it was only when I found out that it was a real production car that sort of sparked my, my interest in actually owning one. Um, and I sort of pursued it from, from there really. Um, became more interested in it as a car as opposed to uh, a time machine. <laughs> I grew up, you know, uh, watching Back to the Future. It was part of my childhood. Those films were out and I've watched them so many times as of a lot of people my age. So that's where I first saw the car. Um, I never thought back then that I'd end up having one. Um, but as, as you know, life goes on, um, I got interested in cars as I was growing up, got interested in classic cars. Um, and I, I, I got to thinking, you know, maybe I could have a DeLorean. Um, and uh, for me, the, the uniqueness of the car, the design of it is what really appeals, as well as all its history, you know, and the story behind it and the development and, and all that, I like all that story. But, it, you know, the uniqueness and the design of it, you can look at this car from any angle and it's just, it's just so unusual, the design. And I really, I really like that style. It's got this iconic 80s style about it. But it's different than that as well because there's just never been another car since that's anything like it. You know, the stainless steel bodywork, the gullwing doors, it's, it's just so unique and, and that's, that's the main drive for me. That was why I really wanted the car. This was actually my first car that I ever owned um, and that was alongside learning to drive in, in everyday cars. This was, the, this was the first car that I sort of took to the road in, which was unusual to say the least. Uh, I bought this car having saved up for the uh, best part of 10 years for it uh, since I was about eight years old um, and I just got my heart sort of set on it, saved up and was around at the right time uh, when one came up. Uh, the, the guy needed a quick sale, it sort of worked, worked to my advantage um, and I, I, I got it uh, against several other people that were trying to, trying to buy the thing at the same time. I was lucky enough to get there early and uh, I managed to, to get it, the one that was already in the country. Uh, initially, when I was trying to get insurance, uh, I would ring up companies and they basically, I should explain the scenario and they say, well, you know, this doesn't exist. This scenario doesn't exist because there are no 18 year olds that have this car in this country and computer says no. <laughs> um, so yeah, they, they had to initially invent a, uh, a policy that would, would get me uh, on the insurance for it. Uh, which was quite amusing and another another obstacle that I had to sort of overcome in, in wanting to achieve the dream of having one of these and driving it. Um, I've been interested in DeLoreans for a number of years before I bought the car. Um, however, because of the price of the car, it took a while before I had finances and able to buy one. Um, this car was actually from America. Um, I had looked at cars that were for sale in the UK previously to buying this, but at the time there weren't any available um, except for one, which I did go to have a look at, but it needed far too much work. It was a bit of a project and I didn't really want to get involved with a, with a project uh, car as such as this. So 
Uh, I started looking at America um, at first, looking at owners, clubs, forums, things like that, looking at what cars were available. Um, but in the end, this one showed up on eBay. Um, so I got in touch with the seller, um, had a number of conversations with him over the phone. He sent me a lot of pictures of the car and videos and things like that, really quite helpful. Um, which is good because obviously it's a bit of a risk buying a car from America. You, you're never really going to know what's, what you're going to get until it gets here. So as mo many pictures as you can get, the better really. I didn't go over to see the car in person just because of the cost of doing that, but I felt at ease because of you know the communication I'd had with the seller and pictures and videos and so on. I ended up winning the auction on eBay and, um, and then about three months later, um, it, it was delivered to uh, Southampton docks. I arranged all the shipping uh, through a shipping agent and um, that went quite smoothly. There were no real hiccups with that. Um, you, you do have to do a little bit of research on it because um, there is tax and things like that which you have to pay. There's a VAT. There's also import duty which you can get away with without paying because it's uh, effectively manufactured within the UK then exported to America and you're bringing it back so if you know all these little loopholes you can get away without paying the import duty. It is a bit of a risk buying something without actually physically seeing it as well as you know obviously the value of the car it makes that risk even greater um, however the the car was known to one of the owners clubs in America uh, so I was able to get on the forums over there and ask people what they knew about the history of the car um, and, and also, like, like I say, the, uh, the, the amount of information I got from the seller um, made it less of a risk. Um, I mean, he was even as helpful as to go to his local garage and get it up on a ramp and get pictures of all the underneath, which was great. Um, when I actually got it over here, I um, went to pick it up from Southampton. Um, it was running when I when I got there. The guy at the docks drove it round the corner and I saw it driving towards me for the first time. You know, it started on the button. Um, and it was it was better than I expected. Um, you know the, the the chassis and things like that, which is one of the main things you have to check when you're buying a, a DeLorean. It, it was perfect. You know there were there were things wrong with it that I knew about, um, such as the interior needed retrimming and things like that. Uh, but luckily for me, no surprises. We went to pick it up from Southampton. Um, it was a really rainy day, uh, probably the first time the car had ever seen such weather. Um, the car was originally a California car and then I bought it from the second owner in Florida. So not used to UK weather. We trailered it back all the way from Southampton up to Manchester and uh, it was just raining all the way back. Um, you know, really, really bad, really bad day. Um, but yeah, it was still great. We, we got it out to, to my house and uh, then started preparing it for its MOT. My ownership of the car has been, been fairly easy going. I mean, a lot of the work that I've done to it has been more because I've wanted to do it, enhancements, modifications uh, uh, to improve certain aspects of the car, um, as well as cosmetic things. Um, it's never let me down. It's been the most reliable car I've ever had, to be honest. It's been really, really good. Um, a lot of the work I've done on it has been things like retrimming the seats. They were slightly damaged when I got it. Um, the suspension's all been renewed as much as an enhancement as anything else because there's much better components you can get for it now. There's improvements that, that the owners clubs and vendors have, have, have made available. Um, so I've not had to do a huge deal of work. You know, there is cars out there that have needed complete restorations or rolling restorations. This hasn't really needed it. It's been, um, it's been looked after throughout, throughout its life. It's always been garaged. Um, but saying that, there's been, there's been things I've restored, such as paintwork and things like that. The front and back ends have been re-sprayed, re, uh, re but nothing that any 31-year-old classic car wouldn't need. You know, general wear and tear, really. Uh, this one's done 76,000 miles. Um, I've probably put on it now about 7,000 miles. Day-to-day -day driving of this car is um, like nothing else. You can't really get away from the attention, so if you go out to pick up fuel or, or just you know drive from A to B you'll always get somebody following you to take a photograph or to ask you questions whenever you stop and you know some people have gone as far as actually following me to wherever I'm going um, just to, to stop and, and ask a question or just to simply look at the car because they're, they're really interested in it and most people have never seen one there's, there's not that many in the country so it doesn't doesn't really surprise me every time you go out it's sort of fresh wave of people that have never seen one before probably one of the most um unique and iconic parts of the car's design is the gullwing doors um they open raise up like that hinging from near the center of the roof 
Um, and there is a misconception and it's, it's been reported that the, the DeLoreans must need, you know, a, a quite a wide gap. You can't park it close to another car because the, you wouldn't be able to get out. It is just that, a misconception. They actually only need about a foot of clearance, much less than an ordinary car. They're quite practical, uh, being that you can get in the car quite easily, even, if, even though it is a, a low car, a low down car. They're actually quite easy to keep clean. Uh, but they do get dirty very easily, so you, you do find you forever you are forever doing that if you like to see it as a clean car. Um, I just clean my car with a hot bucket of water, soapy water, um, and then you can use various stainless steel cleaners such as standard kitchen cleaner to uh, specialist high polish cleaners, all of which are readily available in most sort of supermarkets. If you do get any damage to the, the panels, um, you find there are specialists that can uh, get them out, uh, but most uh, body shops that you go to are, are horrified by it, mainly because they've never seen one before. Um, but there are specialists that if you own one, you, you will find out through the clubs, etc., cetera, um, that can basically repair a completely dented panel to, to brand new. And um, you, you would never know really that there'd been a problem with it. Um, and with the, the nature of the, the finish of the car, if you get any cross scratches or anything, you can actually regrain it yourself. And the, the cleaning kit, funnily enough, comes with a wire pad uh, so that you can, you can rebrush the car and effectively sort of restore the shine of it. The handling is quite good. I mean, don't forget it was developed by Lotus. Um, what didn't do them any good really was the fact that to get through various uh, American regulations, they changed the, the original Lotus design quite a bit. One of the changes was because of the, the bump height regulations that were in effect in the early 80s. Um, as standard as Lotus designed it, the, bumper were too, the front bumper were too low, so what they did um, just to get it through the regulations that were in effect, they uh, fitted higher front springs. That got it through the regulations in America and they could sell it, but it completely ruined the handling. Um, so what a lot of UK owners have done is fit shorter front springs onto the front, which brings it back down to the intended ride height. Um, that really makes a difference. As well as that, you know, bear in mind it's a now a 31-year-old classic car and like any cars of the, of the age, you know, it's going to need new shocks, new bushes, things like that. What I've done on mine is replace all the original rubber bushes with polyurethane bushes and put sports shock absorbers on it along with the, uh, the correct front springs and it's completely transformed the handle in it and now handles really, really well. Um, you know, for, for a car of this age, the, the design that it is, it's uh, as good as you'd expect, really. Uh, I think there are a lot of misconceptions about the performance of the car, um, mainly through the media, that people mixing up the, the troubles that the company had with problems with the car because really this car didn't fail because of technical problems or quality issues. It was the business side behind that that let it down. The car was conceived uh, initially by John DeLorean as his American idea, but he took it to a famous Italian designer, famous for designing the Esprit and lots of other sports cars, um, who basically developed the, the concept that he came up with. Uh, in Italy then um, that was refined in, to make it mass, mass producible as it were and uh, really engineer all, all the you know components of it by Lotus in England um, largely you know British French car parts uh, off the shelf so you it's a real mix of um, origins you know where, where it's where it's come from also that it was made in uh, in Ireland uh, in Northern Ireland mainly because of uh, the grants that were being offered uh, to bring work to the area because there was a lot of trouble in Northern Ireland at that time particularly in Belfast and uh, the, the British government put forward this proposition that they would they would pr provide X number of million pounds uh, to support the employment of, of Nor Northern Irish uh, people uh, in order to you know, learn how to build the car and build the car there. So it was largely unskilled workforce, um, but they kept their side of the bargain, which was to provide jobs, which is often uh, mistaken, really. A lot of people think that the company um, got away with a lot of money, um, sort of fraudulently, which, although there, there are a few sort of question marks over certain transactions, generally speaking, 
uh, they stuck to their their side of the bargain and they gave the jobs they said they were going to give it was just unfortunate that the uh, the car didn't take off as as much as they would have liked so sales were quite uh, initially they couldn't make them quick enough but by the time they were getting cars to market um, interest had sort of dried up a little bit um, so there was a lot of a lot of cars sat waiting in, on forecourts once once they finally made it over to the states. Um, so yeah, I mean it's it's kind of a a misconception that it failed for reasons of, of quality um, and um, controversy, uh, which is just not the case. It's it's purely down to business logistics, unfortunately, not being able to to meet the demand when it was there. In in the years since the since the company uh, went bust there have been you know enthusiastic owners that have sought w ways of uh, improving things that, that were problematic on occasion and it's it really is on occasion you know people have different kinds of problems with their cars and uh, it, it's great because the, the the solutions that come come up now you know to much more modern standards and the, the car that you see today largely performs better than the original ever did it's a great car to drive. It's a lot of fun to drive, and it 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 really is a driver's car. You know, I mean, that's maybe a cliche thing to say, but it you have to drive it. There's no kind of automatic side of things. There's no power steering, and you're very you're very in control of it manually. So yeah, it's a heck of a lot of fun to drive, and um, never a dull moment. This is a 1981 DeLorean. Um, the main visual differences between the model years um, are around the bonnet area, really. Um, you've got these styling lines on the bonnet of the 1981 DeLoreans and also a fuel filler cap. You get a lot of questions about this, a lot of people coming over at shows asking what this is. It's actually the fuel cap. Um, they, they, they did away with this on the later DeLoreans in 1982 because there they were complaints from owners in the early days in America that they'd take the car through a car wash and the brushes had, had flipped this up and it'd, it'd get damaged. So they actually just did away with it and had the bonnet completely smooth. Owning a, a DeLorean car is extremely uh, good investment, really. They, they don't they don't depreciate in value unless there is any obvious really bad problems like you, you've crashed it and there's there's a lot of damage is obviously going to reduce the value but generally speaking the more miles you put on it doesn't really affect the value of it they um, they're only on the increase and the, and the popularity is um, really increasing uh, to the point that they are they're so popular the the company's re-established itself and you can actually buy a remanufactured DeLorean the, wait, the waiting list of which is um, over a year, I believe. Um, but they don't come cheap. <laughs> Since I bought the car, uh, its its value has sort of increased significantly uh, through sort of general upkeep and, you know, repairing problems that is common with all classic cars, really, just because of their age. Um, you know, you, you don't come across many 31-year-old cars that are completely untouched by, by that age. Um, so there, there are the things that are perishable. Uh, you replace them, and that you know brings them, keeps their value quite high because they're still very usable cars. It's not a problem driving a left-hand drive car. Um, it's it's quite a different car to drive than an everyday car anyway. Um, you're in, it's a very low down driving position. Um, it's a very comfortable driving position. Your legs are out quite far in front of you, and you kind of got this you know um, quite a, quite a lot of room in front of you. It's quite roomy inside. Um, it's not really a problem driving it with it being left-hand drive until it comes to things like overtaking. Um, you just can't see around the cars in front, but that would be a problem with any left-hand drive car in a right-hand drive country. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's not, not really a problem. You've got the centre console in, 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 in outside of you here, you've got electric windows, rear demist, um, fog light controls, things like that. And, um, it's this, well, this one is a manual. Um, I've added this stainless steel shifter onto it. It's normally a, a black plastic one, but it's a nice uh, modification. Um, it's got air conditioning. You've got all the air conditioning controls there. Um, for a car of its area, era, it's actually um, it's actually got everything a modern car would have. You've got electric windows, electric mirrors, air conditioning. Um, so yeah, it's it's quite a comfortable 
comfortable car to, to drive really because of that and also because it's quite roomy. Uh, for a two-seater sports GT, you've got a lot of space, it's quite wide, you're not that close to your passenger, even the driving position, you, you're not close to the windscreen and you've got plenty of space behind you for luggage. Uh, people tend to ask how much luggage you can get into it in the boot space with it being a small two-seater sports car. Uh, you've actually got quite a lot of space under, under the, the bonnet there. Um, you can fit quite a bit of luggage in there, it's, uh, it's quite, quite deceiving. Um, and underneath there you've got a spare wheel as well, so there's plenty of room. Inside the car itself there is uh, space behind the seats as well. There's a cargo net there and you can actually get quite a bit of luggage behind there. I have a great sense of uh, pride and achievement when I, when I drive around in this car. Um, just because of every, the history that's behind it and what it what it took for me to be able to get a part of that history, um, I can put it away for a, a few weeks and I go back and it's it's kind of like a giant Christmas present under a cover. It's a great sense of uh, enjoyment to to be able to drive it and and sort of introduce other people to it um, that aren't familiar with with the the car, the company, and. Uh, everything about it because they've never seen one before it's great to make people smile <laughs> you feel part of like the story of the delorean you know it's it's got such a story and such, such history behind it and for me I, i'm really interested in all that i'm really interested in the development of the car the the story behind the company john delorean the, the lotus involvement in it it's it's a really sort of unique interesting story there's a lot of misconceptions with it and there's a lot of bits and pieces that were reported at the time but not in as much detail and when you really research it and go into it it's really interesting i've had the car on the road about three and a half years um, throughout that i've had so much fun with the car um, not only just through driving out for days out myself you know just on weekends I even use it to go to work sometimes whenever you take it out it, it's a it's a great experience um, you know it's fun to drive um, it puts a smile on everybody's face when they see it, you know, it does get a lot of attention and you've got to be aware of that when you go into buying one, um, it gets attention wherever you go. So yeah, it's, it's been really good. The DeLorean DMC-12, a true classic or just an 80s oddity? Certainly interest in DeLoreans and demand for good examples has never been higher. With prices on the rise and continued availability of original and remanufactured parts, the future looks rosy for this most monochromatic of motor cars. Love it for its groundbreaking use of materials, or hate it for its brutalist 80s looks, the DeLorean is one of a kind. And isn't that the ultimate accolade for a classic?